sir. Iraq. What was your branch of service? Army. And what was the highest rank in which you served? PFC. And in what general locations did you serve at? Uh, I was stationed out of Schweinfurt, Germany, <clears throat> and uh, I was deployed uh, over to Tikrit, Iraq. Those are two areas. And uh, were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. And uh, where were you living at the time you enlisted? Uh, Lewiston, Maine. What year was it that you enlisted in? 2001. Okay. How old were you? I was 18. 18. And uh, uh, so why did you join the Army? Uh, at the time, it was just the best, uh, the best option I had. Were you fresh out of Job Corps? <clears throat> I was fresh out of Job Corps. Okay. I just earned my GED. Um, I was living with a bunch of buddies that were just a bunch of partiers. And uh, I realized if I uh, didn't want to end up like them, because they were all older than me, I had to figure out doing something else. So I uh, looked into going to the military. So, you enlisted. Where did you enlist um, to, like, what enlistment office? Like, where was that located? Lewiston, Maine. And uh, so, where did you go to basic training? The basic training at Fort Benning, Georgia. And can you tell me a little bit about that? Uh, it was hot. <laughs> um, we were the last non combat arms because <clears throat> my job wasn't a combat arms job, but I was one of the last non combat arms. Uh, basic training groups to get washed through Fort Benning, and our drill sergeants and our sergeant major, they always made you know they always made sure we remembered it, you know, and they always made sure that you know no matter what they're producing the best of the best if it came out of Fort Benning, it was uh, it was a good time. I learned a lot about myself, learned a lot about people. Um, it was probably one of the most educating times I ever had. Actually, think about it. And how long did the basic training last? Uh, nine weeks. Uh, what kind of training did you learn specifically? Like specifically? Uh, let's see. We learned uh, we learned drills. We learned uh, marksmanship. We learned physical fitness training. We learned uh, <clears throat> basic survival skills, uh, bivouacking skills, um, camping skills, if you might want to call them. Um, we were, you know, once again, we were all uh, marksmanship. Uh, Grenades. We learned how to use grenades. We also learned how to use uh, or proficient in other uh, weaponsry that um, the combat arms guys would use. You know, and we just we ran. And we also learned how to become one out of fifty. So that's what it really boiled down to. Wow. And do you remember your instructors? <laughs> I remember them. Yeah, I remember them. Can you explain them to me? Uh, so you had a. Well, by the time when he graduated, he was Sergeant First Class Penn. He was uh, he was on a drill. He was an MP, old timer. Um, he loved the military, loved the army. You know, if you didn't give it one hundred ten percent, he was all over you. Didn't matter. He wanted the best, produced the best. He was gonna, you know, <clears throat> we weren't combat arms. We weren't infantry. Neither was he, and that meant a big thing to him. You know, he was like, I'm gonna produce what infantry produces here at Fort Benning. I'm gonna ride you guys like you've never been ridden before, and uh, he did. And uh, drill sergeant San San Sansuki Sansaki, I can't really pronounce. He was Hawaiian. He was awesome, a little short dude, um, motivator. You know, young. He was he was more of the motivator. Drill sergeant Penn was more of the disciplinary action and you know getting your getting your face. And the other one was more of like you know put you to the side, boost you back up. They uh, they made a great pair. Made a great team, and um, I have a lot of good memories from a lot of learning stuff. So I've I've always referred to them throughout my life. <laughs> so after the nine weeks of basic training at, in uh, Georgia, where did you go? I went to uh, Fort Sam Houston, <coughs> not Fort Sam, Fort Jackson. I'm sorry, Fort Jackson in uh, the Carolinas, and uh, it was nice. I went there for um, administrative assistant training. It was another. I want to say nine weeks. Um, we had more freedom. Got weekend passes, stuff like that. Uh, you know, it wasn't as bad as um, as basic. You know, your whole day was pretty much spent doing um, your training for that year specific job. 
Um, a lot of people went to Fort Jackson. They had the cooks there. They had all the different admin people there. So, I mean, we stayed pretty busy. Um, it was okay. It was all right. It, it seemed like the base coming from Fort Benning going to Fort Jackson was a complete and utter... I went from an infantry, diehard infantry base to, you know, Fort Jackson. We trained administrative assistants and cooks, and I was like, oh, my God. It's like I went from the, you know, hardness of the heart to the freaking this, oh, shit. So it took a little time for me to get used to, especially with the way the drill sergeants were over there. They were a lot more lax to an extent, but um, they were good. They were all right. I don't really remember most of them. So, yeah. What kind of no, not in Texas, in uh, Fort Jackson. Oh, Fort Jackson. <clears throat> no, it's all right. Uh, Fort Jackson administrative assistant training is um, you get put in an S1 shop, you learn how to type, you learn how to file by the military filing dates, you uh, learn how to do specific forms and whatnot like that. Like all your basic forms you're always going to run into. They want you to be proficient with leave forms, um, <clears throat> family separation, all sorts of stuff. And uh, what it is is you're... Uh, you're training to be a company personnel, pretty much. Um, you take care of everybody in the company. If somebody has a finance issue, they come up with a document that you need to proofread and make sure it's all set, or you need to type it up for them, uh, depending on you know when they come and all that. Uh, so you need to be proficient in tons and tons of documents. Uh, you need to be proficient in how to organize them and get them sent up with whatever other supporting documents you need in order for them to get a first time pass. Um, but mostly down there it was uh, it was filing systems, forms, and typing. You know, basic clerical skills. Everything else you learned when you got to your unit. So where did you go after uh, after that? Uh, after that, I actually came home because I was in a reserve unit. When I first signed up, that was the thing. When I had initially signed up up at the uh, recruiting station, I had no idea I was joining the reserves. <laughs> so I'm thinking the entire time that I'm active army, and then they tell me during like halfway through my basic that no, you're a reservist. I was like, that can't be true. That can't be true. And I was, I was, I was losing my mind. <clears throat> so what I did was uh, in AIT when I was at Fort Jackson, I started making moves. I got my unit transferred down to the Connecticut unit. I came back to Connecticut and uh, I stayed about six, seven months in my reserve unit. And then I put in the paperwork to get transferred to active duty. And uh, once I did that, I was uh, sent over to Schweinfurt, Germany. So why did you go from reserve to active duty? Uh, it's just I couldn't, I couldn't fathom not being a, a soldier 24 hours a day after. <clears throat> when, you fresh, when you come fresh out of... Uh, basic and AIT, you know, and you don't get to go to a unit and stay in that mode. You come home, you're kind of like wound up, you know, you're just, I don't know, you're so used to, to doing stuff. You're so used to, to working and doing all this stuff and just working as a team. And now you got to come home and you get to do it one week in a month, two weeks a year. Mm -hmm. No, nah, that's ridiculous. So, um, describe, uh, so you went to Germany, where in Germany did you go? Uh, Schweinfurt, Germany. Schweinfurt, Germany, and how long were you there? I was there for, uh, three, three years. So you said you were in, uh, Schweinfurt, Germany? Yeah, Schweinfurt, Germany. Okay, so how long were you there again? Uh, a little shy of three years total. Three years, wow. And mm -hmm. can you explain those years, like, what you did there? Uh, yeah, I went to, uh, I first got to Schweinfurt, Germany. I was in uh, a unit called 126 yeah. Infantry. And um, I was there for about three months, and they ended up shipping me across town to the other unit, which was 118 Infantry, which I ended up serving with the rest of my tour. I ended up going to the HHC department there, or HHC company. And uh, I was put in the S1 shop. And uh, <clears throat> I ended up making a name for myself. I... Uh, I got real good at the paperwork, and I knew how to maneuver around all the uh, all the red tape and whatnot. Because I became friends with the civilian workers that worked up at the main offices and stuff like that. And it, you know, a, a bottle of nice dessert wine for you and your husband tonight goes a long ways when it comes to turning in a pa packet. You know, so there was always something. I I made sure that I was able to 
no matter what, if I had turned in paperwork that had a mistake and I didn't catch, they would normally give that paperwork back to you, make you leave and come back. No, they correct it for me right there. So, I mean, it was just, it was cool. Everybody knew me. <clears throat> um, then uh, I had the medics come up to me. And because I was so famous amongst the unit with everybody, they wanted to know if I wanted to be their uh, security detail because the medics needed somebody from S1 as a security guard for when they're tending to the wounded, seeing how they can, they can, but they cannot fire back. And uh, I couldn't understand why, but I was the only one in my office that was big enough to carry a machine gun and I was the only one that knew how to shoot it. So it was, <laughs> it's kind of two things. They wanted somebody that they liked and you know, I was the only person that actually kind of knew what he was doing with it. Um, that's what I did. I, uh, I did paperwork and I trained with the medics. And I, that's that's it. You know, I used to have uh, other people from different companies call me up, come and see me. Um, you know, the 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 paper the paper workers down from the company area, they they weren't paper. You know, they weren't administrative assistants. They were guys that got hurt, that were infantry at one time, and now they're doing this until they go home. But they don't go home for another year, so they got to get decent at this. They're coming to see me. They're calling me down to their office. <laughs> what do you need? Where are you going this week? And oh, hey, check this out. I got tickets for this. Have you? Do you, do you know anything about so and so's command sponsorship? It was just. It was funny. It was. It was a good time. Well, so but, after those three years of being in Germany, were you stationed anywhere else? Or what well, that was uh, my three. That was my unit. It was in Germany, but uh, during those three years, I was also stationed in Iraq. Amongst those three years. Oh, okay. So um, I was just with the unit for about three years. They were primarily stationed out of Germany. Oh, okay. But uh, halfway through our stunt, we ended up going to uh, to Crit Iraq. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, uh, that's where things got interesting. And uh, so what were your job tasks? It was to, to uh, the medics or did you have other things that you were doing in Iraq? I was doing other things in Iraq. Um, I was doing convoys. I was going on... Uh, Lots of mail convoys and whatnot because it was part of S1's job. Um, when the medics rolled out to a specific area to do specific things, if it was a mission then that called for, you know, we may have to set up a, a, an area for wounded, then I would fly out with them, you know, I would travel with them. Um, primarily, my job was to go around and collect uh, KIA carts. And uh, it's probably the worst job you could ever have. It's uh, killed in action cards. What happens is uh, <clears throat> S1 has to have a representative go around. They have to collect the cards. But you also have to get details from everybody. So not only are you like, you know, the, uh, the guy who's got to come and dredge up all this shit. But now you're, you know, you're the first person these guys have talked to by themselves. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's, it, it was interesting. You know, guys were afraid to see me after they come back, especially if they had wounded or killed in action because I'd have to go and I'd have to sit with everybody individually, go over their cards with them, you know, the people that saw it, the people that were there, if they saw it, whatnot. And uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it, was, it was pretty, uh, pretty shit detail. You know, I had a lot of guys break down on me. Um, the guys threatened to shoot me, you know, I, yeah. Why yeah. That? I, you know, you, you got to walk in there and you got to catch them after they just came back from a mission. And, you know, you, I, I, I give them some time, you know, I'm not one to come running over and be like, Hey, what happened? But, you know, I know within a certain amount of time I have to have these cards in and I have to have the report in and turn into my NCOs. And uh, so I have to make something happen. And I mean, you come back and these guys are, you know, they're a mess. They just saw their buddy get hit by an IED or an RPG just, you know, came into a, an up-armored vehicle because we were, we were driving. We had all old school vehicles. We didn't have any of the up-armored vehicles. Uh, the few we did have, the command walk, you know, the colonel and all them they used. Um, <clears throat> we were driving in five tons from Vietnam. <laughs> You know, we, we had a lot of old vehicles. <clears throat> it was definitely uh, 
definitely uh definitely interesting you know so i mean you gotta sit down you gotta drudge that shit up and some guys take it okay they understand it's just my job they understand that it's the you know, reality is if we want replacements for these guys we gotta we gotta get these numbers in or else we're gonna be working thin you know and uh some guys didn't you know some guys would just they would they would take it as an insult they would get all pissy they get all mad you know we'd get into it a little bit a little scuffle you know and finally they would just listen at the end you know that or one of their buddies would hear in another room they'd come in and they would you know they'd get involved but uh yeah, people people used to hate seeing me after a while. And uh it was it was rough, you know, because you're friends with a lot of these guys, you partied with a lot of these guys, you know. Um it was it was interesting, you know. Just just a few the few things that, you know, we were exposed to or happened to us. You know, it's 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 interesting how they changed everybody. You know, we used to laugh and joke and stuff. Now we don't even want to talk to each other. But, you know, it was, it was a job. You had, you had to do what you had to do. So kind of to backtrack, uh, where were you stationed in Iraq? Then? To crit Iraq. Okay. And what was your first like, feeling of that when you first saw the country around? Uh, I'm stuck here. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> Uh yeah, it was it was pretty hot. We came in on the back of a Hemet, <clears throat> which is an eighteen wheeler truck, mm -hmm. and uh, we drove in. We were in a Bradley vehicle, so we had like zero space to do anything. We got to pop a hatch and hang out the hatch for some air. <laughs> it was pretty much it. Um, so yeah, I mean, looking around, you saw a couple trees, mostly sand. Some stone houses, just a real desolate place, you know. Yeah. And, uh, you weren't around any like towns. Or <clears throat> we were on the outside of uh, Tikrit. We were right on the. Uh, we were in the sticks of Tikrit, as you call it, almost like being in Winston, Connecticut. <laughs> you, uh, we could see where Saddam's palace was and everything like that, but our the rest of our unit and all the other people stayed over there. We stayed at an unfinished palace. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And did you see any combat? Yeah. yeah. Do you want to go into detail about that? No. Okay. And uh, did, you, uh, did you experience any casualties within your unit? Yeah. Yeah, quite a few. Quite a few. Quite a few. Did you sustain any injuries yourself while you were over there in Iraq? No. No. And uh, were you ever a prisoner of war? No. And uh, what kind of, were you awarded any citations or medals? Uh, just the usual, the uh, Army accommodation, um, good conduct medal. Nothing really out of, out of ordinary or anything like that. And, um, okay. And uh, how did you stay in touch with your family while you were over there? Um, I had a simple method. No news is good news. <laughs> so I didn't bother calling or writing. I didn't, I didn't really feel like talking to anybody back home. Um, and I told him from the start, I said, you know, no news is good news. If anything does happen to me, you'll know within 24 hours. So plain and simple, um, I'll see you guys when I get home. You know, the last thing I need is to talk to you and have to go out on a mission and, you know, my mind be wandering somewhere else, you know. Um, so yeah, no news was good news. That was that was my whole key. And uh, what was the food like while you were there? Uh, we used to get food trucked in from the other base because we were such a small fob that we we didn't have the assets for um, the cooks to really cook. So we used to go and get a we used to call it gut rot, and uh, we'd go down to the other base and get all the hot trays and bring them on back, and we'd eat. Uh, did you always have enough supplies, or was there a shortage? Um, it wasn't that we were ever in shortage because we were without. We were in shortage because the truck would get blown up. Um, you know, convoys, the best convoys to attack were, you know, the water convoy, the mail convoy, 
<clears throat> materials. You know, they weren't they weren't stupid. So it wasn't the fact that the government didn't provide for us. It was the fact that we couldn't catch the ship back to our base sometimes. <laughs> so. Uh, what would you have to do if uh, a convoy got blown up? Or did they just send another or what would uh, First and foremost, you, uh, you assess the situation when it happens. You know, you, you try to get everybody out of there and um, get to the closest fob or the closest, you know, safe point that you can call in. Hope that somebody's close and can come and assist you and, uh, you know, assess it from there. But mostly it's, you know, get to the closest fob. Uh, did you ever feel any pressure or stress during your time in, in Iraq? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, you, uh, <clears throat> for me, I wouldn't let guys that would go out on missions all the time go do routine missions like uh, routine convoys. You know, I, I refused to. I didn't think it was right. And uh, the guys that worked with me in my S1 shop, they all knew how I felt about that. Um, if our boys are out there for, you know, every day <clears throat> and we only get to go out three days a week, you know, let it be us to go do those three days a week so those guys don't have to get called in on it pretty much. And uh, they hated me for it, but we did a lot of missions. We had a lot of fun. We used to go do a lot of, a lot of crazy convoys. Um, it was just, you know, it was, it was, a, it was a good time. <laughs> No. no. And um, how did you entertain yourself while you were playing? Your um, my parents used to send me care boxes. Would like um, go to the dollar store and stock up on silly putty and Nerf footballs and coloring books and crayons and all sorts of stuff and just send over boxes to us. And uh, I used to pick out what I wanted out the boxes and I would put it out in front of my door and everybody would come up. You know, they would know I'd get like three boxes from my folks and everybody be all sorts of crap and then one would be food one would be you know cosmetics the other one would be fun stuff we would take like i don't know the nerf footballs and we would tape the glow sticks to them that my dad got and you know we'd throw them around and stuff like that oh that's nice and did you go to any uso shows no, no. the miller light girls landed at our base by accident <laughs> so what happened there? How did that happen? Um, I don't quite know, but <laughs> it was uh, it was definitely a great time. Um, <laughs> did they stay there for a while. They stayed there overnight. <clears throat> Dude, they I guess they took a couple pop shots, and uh, they stayed there for the night. But because we were an all male base, it was like a oh god, it was like a nightmare for the command. They were trying to figure out who was the most trustworthy to stand guard out in front of the door. It was just oh god, it was horrible. Kind of awesome. Yeah, it was it was it was a great time. That they were they were cool. The girls were cool, and uh, Vince Vaughn came by one time. Oh, that's nice. And uh, he was cool. He signed a bunch of bootlegs, and uh, kicked their ass at Madden. He <laughs> didn't let you win. No, I was talking shit too. <laughs> and uh, did you ever go on leave? No. No, you were there straight three years. No leave at all. No, not three years. Three years was my complete tour. Oh, okay. How long were you in Iraq total then? For 13 months. 13 months, okay. So you didn't go on leave any, at all during that time. And uh, do you recall any particular humorous, humorous or other unusual events that happened? No. No? <laughs> and uh, what were some of the, or actually, um, what did you think of the officers that you, uh, you worked with while you were in Iraq? Um... Well, he's now General Sinclair. He was Colonel Sinclair at the time. Uh, he's one of the best damn officers I've ever worked with. Nice. Um, I had a diehard uh, company commander. He was great. Um, my first sergeant, we always didn't see eye to eye, but he was one of the best damn first sergeants I ever had. Sergeant Major was phenomenal, too. Um, had a bunch of decent, uh, decent officers. You know, some really decent officers, and I had some decent NCOs. So, I mean, there was the few that were shit bags that, you know, got where they got for being what they were just because, um, you know, you have those anywhere. But for a majority of it, we, we had some really good guys. That's great. And did you keep a journal while you were? Yeah. That's nice. What were the kind of things that you wrote in the journal just day of 
just different things. Um, you know, different things I had to do, who I had to see, just to it help me with my memory too. You know, if I had to recall something or if, you know, what I was doing on what day, um, you know, it was, it was easy for me to go back and look at it and just be like, oh yeah. So I just, uh, it was, it was pretty much just like a, um, like a tracker, you know, I wouldn't even really call it a journal. You know, uh, I went here, saw him, saw him for this, for that, for this, for that. Uh, at this time I did this, at that time I was on this convoy from here to here, stuff like that. Now, were you required to keep the journal or did you just do it for your own personal reasons? I just did it for my own personal reasons. Oh, okay. And, uh, so what happened after you were stationed in Iraq for 13 months? I came home. You came home here to the United States? Yeah. Okay. And, um, so did you come home to Connecticut? Yeah. Oh, okay. And, um, when were you discharged from the military? September 10th, 2004. 2004? And uh, what, was it feel, what did it feel like to be discharged? I couldn't really believe it. Um, I don't know. I was, uh, I was like 20 minutes out of the military and back in civilian life and I was already mad. <laughs> Why were you mad? Because the people around me were stupid. <laughs> Nobody worked as a team. It was just a big cluster. Every time, you know, I was trying to go pick up my bags and it was, you know, fighting against people instead of just making an organized line. You know, common sense is not common. So it was, uh, it was interesting, you know. I was, it was what it was. And uh, what did you do during, like, the days or the weeks after you um, I worked. I was on a roof the next day. Wow. Um, so you got into your, to your building or contracting? Or what I just went back to what I knew how to do. Oh, okay. And, uh, I mean, I had no idea about any of the benefits I had. Nobody, you know, when I got discharged, they never told me about, you know, you can collect unemployment for six months, you can go back to school. Um, you can do this, you know, they, they never told me about any of that stuff. And uh, I started, I tried working with the, um, with the VA hospital at the time. And uh, they, they didn't want nothing to do with me because my unit was supposed to do everything I was asking them to do. And it was just a complete and utter nightmare. Um, the VA at the time was, was not the VA it is now. Um, I pretty much walked away from them. You know, I didn't want nothing to do with them after the way I was treated. <clears throat> so and I just went. I just went and worked. That's it. You know, I, I did what. You know, I had to stay busy. I had to keep my hands busy. So you didn't uh, receive any benefits after you came out, or did you did you get them eventually, or what happened? I received my benefits eventually. Um, what kind of benefits did you receive? I uh, I'm fifty percent PTSD. Um, my knee, my back, um, my hearing, uh, and my, uh, believe it or not, my toe. So. And um, did you make any close friendships with the people that you served? Like the yeah, I still stay in touch with a lot of them. Um, matter of fact, they, those new smartphones, you can play those clan games. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, believe it or not, we're all in a clan. So there's, there's 20 of us that still stay in touch. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's pretty cool. And um, so you're continuing with those relationships? As much as possible. Everybody's got, you know, a lot of them stayed in the service. A couple of them got out. Some of them ended up killing themselves. Um, so, I mean, now there's only 20 of us left. You know, it started off as 35. Wow. And now there's only 20 of us that stay, you know, stay in touch with each other and stuff. Um, so, you know, we uh, we try, like, if anybody's traveling, if I know I'm going down to North Carolina, we're right near Fort Bragg, I call, you know, I get in touch with them. Who's at Fort Bragg? You know, I, I pop in, I see them. You know, we go out, have a couple of beers or something like that, and call it a night, you know. It's just good to see them, see the families and stuff, and that's pretty much it. Yeah, that's nice. And um, so 
you just continued on. What did you do as a career after the military? Uh, mostly contracting. Have you been doing it ever since? Yeah, uh, yes and no. I uh, Different aspects of it. Um, my knee and my back were, were killing me at the time, so uh, I would jump from like sales of contracting and uh, estimates and whatnot to general labor. And um, I would work my way up, you know, I'd end up running a roofing crew. Um, being the boss obviously means you don't have to be the worker, you know, unless you want to. So um, I was, you know, I, I, I ran crews, I did estimates, I, uh, I ran offices. Um, I knew one guy who was a successful contractor, a horrible businessman. And he hired me to run his office in his day-to-day uh, procedures and um, it was good because uh, <clears throat> I I don't think I would have been able to make it in a real real world setting you know um, I was pretty fucked up in the head when I came home I didn't know it but other people noticed it and um, this guy noticed it you know so he he understood that you know I was I was kind of jacked up and you know a little broken so when you say that you Uh, you know, I was uh, real jittery, real antsy, still am, um, I don't sleep that much, you know, it's just, uh, you know, I just, uh, a lot of, I, I actually was given a test and I was told I had all 13 signs of PTSD, and uh, that was given to me by a uh, um, gentleman that worked for the VA, and he wrote up the letter and everything like that, and uh, I never knew I was a real hard person to get along with, you know. Sean told me that all the time. He was like, if it just if it wasn't for you and me interacting, he's like, I don't think you'd be able to interact with anybody else. Um, the only time I ever talked to customers was when I was picking up a check or dropping material or setting up an appointment for Sean to go talk to him. I didn't talk to nobody. I was I was real hardcore. Um, if I could do it in six hours, then nobody else should have any other reason why they can't do it in six hours. Um, I mean, I was a contractor and I had other contractors afraid of me. You know, I was just really, really hardcore. <laughs> there's, there's no other way around it. Um, I spoke how I felt when I was on a crew. Um, I abused guys, but I didn't abuse guys. You know what I'm saying? I would <clears throat> curse you out and stuff like that, but I'd be the first person also to be there and be like, Hey, nice job. Thanks for correcting your mistake and stuff. You know, I go back to work, and as long as you didn't screw up, then you didn't have to hear me talk. And guys picked that up, you know, real, real quick. But um, yeah. So working for a small company, I had no idea, like, actually how bad I was until I went to go work out in the real world and start working for regular companies. And uh, I was let go because I had other employees afraid of me, and I didn't know why. I couldn't understand what I did. I was just being too, you know, I was too jumpy. I was too everything. You know, I made people nervous and I didn't understand what I did. I didn't talk to people. And, you know, it was just my actions, I guess. I was constantly, constantly, constantly I'm alert. I'm always looking around. It was, it's been hard. So I just really stayed contracting because you can work for yourself as a contractor. You can work for guys that understand and, they work around your issues. And um, did you receive any like, therapy or help through the VA with uh, your PTSD? I received some. Um, I wasn't too happy with the uh, counselor I was using. I I stopped doing it because I just I got tired of going down every every week to be asked why do you think that is. If I knew why I was, then I wouldn't be down here asking you why am I not sleeping? Why am I you know? Why can't I, you know, why can't I relax? Why, you know, what what the hell? <laughs> why don't any of these medicines work for me? Why in 30 days do I build up a tolerance to all these medicines that are supposed to be these great God-sent medicines that are supposed to help me? And, you know, they don't help me. I do the complete opposite to me, you know? So I, I really got tired of that. And um, I stopped going to see her, but I joined the VFW and... uh 
I started seeking out counseling through the VFW and some of the outreach places up there. I just, uh, another issue too was, um, I was really put off when I started my vocational rehabilitation when um, my counselor was reading my mental health file verbatim, had it in the computer, and was asking me questions that, you know, I didn't think anybody else had access to read, you know, talking about issues and stuff like that that uh, I didn't think anybody would be able to read, wanting to make sure they were under control and stuff like that. And uh, after that, I swore I would never go back to the VA for any mental health because uh, if one person puts it in the computer, who's to say that nobody else can look it up and read what they want to read. Yeah. You haven't gone back since? Um, I go back what for health issues for my, uh, I go back, you know, I'll go back if they, if they want me to come back and do something. But, um, you know, I've been seeking, you know, outside non VA. And I just, I couldn't get over the fact that nobody should know about this except for you and me. And it's in the computer system. And this lady's in Newington, and she's, she's reading it. Well, it says here in your medical record. Oh, where did you get that information from? Oh, it's in the system. I'm allowed to see it. I just need to make sure that this is, you know, this has been taken care of. And I was, I was a little taken back by that, so. Yeah. And uh, how did your military experience influence uh, your thinking about war with the military in general? I love the military. My experience in the military, good or bad, the bad was always my fault, you know. But there's a lot more good than there was bad. Um, I loved it. I loved every moment of it. You know, um, I, truthfully, I think everybody should either go to college or go to the service. Just do three years, you know. That's just the way I look at it. <clears throat> it's... uh. You know, if, if, if not anything, it just gives you discipline. You know, it gives you a different set of uh, morals and standards you live your life by. And, uh, you know, if you if you lived your life in the service by those, and you can take those standards and those, you know, those morals and you can live your life by them, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty fulfilling, you know. It's um, real simple, real easy standards that we have in the service. And uh, I, I try to take them all and uh, incorporate them in day to day living, and uh, it's it's helped me. You know, I militarized my life kind of sort of to help me get through the days and help me cope with not being in the service. But um, you know, it's it's been good. Everything I learned from the service, I always uh always been able to use something, you know. And uh, did you join any veterans organizations? VFW. I try to get up there for the meetings. Sometimes I'm not successful. Oh, okay. And um, how did your service and experience affect your life, like overall? Um, I like to say it was. It's for the good and the worst, I guess. Um, I'm a mess upstairs in my head, you know. I try, I try not to focus on it, you know, I, I try to do a lot of stuff to spend a lot of time with my son and stuff like that, my wife, you know, I try, you know, try not to really sit down and talk about the service much with people unless I'm, I have to at that specific time, but um, it's, it's, it's affected me for the good and for the worse, you know, uh, the worst being the nightmares at night, not being able to wake up from them. Um, you know, the, the, the anger issues, the paranoia, the, the, the nervousness and stuff. But I mean, the good so supersedes that, you know, I, uh, I got a successful, I've run a successful business for myself, you know, being subcontracted and self-employed through others. Um, I've been successful at it for a couple of years now. I haven't made the greatest of money in the world, but I've made good money where I can afford my house and pay my, my bills and stuff. So I've always uh, always looked at that as being a plus. I don't think I would have gotten that without the 
the discipline and the, the training and being able to push my body and my, my, my mental self as far as I could. I mean, I learned a lot from the service and I don't think I would have gotten any as far as I have today if it wasn't for, you know, key aspects. So. And is there anything you'd like to add that has not been covered in this interview? No. Okay. Well, um, I'd like to thank you for your service and uh, for taking the time to do the interview today. We really appreciate it. Thank you.